So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session of uh, Memory Design and Test Course. So before we start the class, let's just do a quick review of what we were doing in the last one. What were you we doing in the last class? Uh, sir, in the last class, we uh, started uh, uh, with the discussion of possible defects that can happen in a 60 SRAM cell. Mm -hmm. And we look at, uh, looked at the single quad, uh, single double and the quad bit failures and mm -hmm. uh, what, what could be the uh, possible solution to, uh, uh, to, to overcome these failures post-production. And uh, two of the solutions were, uh, one is the row introduction of the redundant two redundant rows and also uh, the other uh, when when there is a failure in the along the column side then we use a uh, redundant column mm -hmm. uh, so that is a bit slice technique okay so which which kind of these schemes is better mm, sir uh, both of them uh, both of them are almost equivalent uh, but uh, having a having a row redundancy is uh, even more better. Okay, why? Uh, sir, each of them has its own pros and cons because uh, in the row redundancy, uh, the overhead will, overhead will be the increased uh, address setup due to the comparison which is involved. Whereas mm -hmm. in the column, uh, uh, whereas in the bit slice technique, the, over, uh, the overhead would be, uh, the control signal and uh, the path uh, through which the uh, the bit line content should go through the mux and then the uh, i bus so this is the delay okay so there is an additional delay in the access path then yes there is an additional delay in the access path okay and anything about area where do we lose more area in the bit slice because we'll have a mux at each uh, columns or at least one dedicated to each IO. So bit less bit slice technique has more area over it. Uh, what about the timing penalty? Which has more timing penalty? We understood that one has a timing penalty on setup time, the other has a timing penalty on access time. Which penalty is higher? Uh, sir, I feel the penalty would be higher in case of the bit slice technique because uh, if you consider a row redundancy, uh, the, the the load is on the address line setup. So uh, uh, it, uh, design techniques should be taken care of such that we'll have uh, uh, lesser amount, uh, that there should be some lesser amount of uh, at time which will be required to access the address. But uh, reading from the memory uh, has no impact in the row redundancy. So bit slice has more timing or timing penalty. This is what I feel. Yeah, timing penalty is fine. Uh, uh, like uh, timing penalty, you saying that row redundancy has uh, row redundancy has a lesser lesser time penalty, lesser timing penalty. So uh, now all of us, uh, let us look into this as what part of these comparisons or evaluations happen during a cycle, during an excess cycle, and what parts can be done much much before at the time of blowing up blowing up the fuses. So for the address, for the row redundancy part, can you do the address comparison just once at the time of power up? Or will you need to compare address in every cycle and then select which row to select? So that we had programmed using the fuse thing, right? At the time of the testing only. So we programmed the failing address. Yes, sir. The comparison, is it to be done only once? Once you know the failing address, ek bar aapne failing address, malab, or do you need to compare every time the new address comes, you have to check if this is the failing address or not. What do you need to do? Every time we have to check if that address is invoked, basically. So in every cycle, you have to evaluate this. So the penalty on setup time actually is real and is for every cycle. Uh, and there is a comparison that has to happen. So there is a comparator which has some delay in it. Hmm. Mm, even if it is two-stage comparator, there are nine-bit addresses or seven-bit addresses, two-stage comparator, even then it is a penalty, it could be easily a penalty of 100 to 200 picoseconds on the setup time. 
So with the bit slice, we have uh, we are having only addition one additional box, right? Only additional circuitry and the select line. So that penalty is less also in that terms. Yeah, for the bit slice thing, do you need to check every time that oh my bit zero? Am I reading bit zero or am I reading bit one? Whenever you select any word, you are reading all the bits of that word anyways, all times. Mm, yes, sir. So once you know that there is a failure in bit four. you can replace bit 4 for all 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 times you don't need to evaluate every cycle so the comparator delay is no longer a criteria here it is only once but in in every active cycle you have an additional mux that is coming into picture mux was also already there you know our mix yes, already have mux you just needing to modify this mux to mux ki loading you are changing the control signals have become a little more complex but essentially the loading of the mux has changed now it is going to two bit lines every output is going to two bit line instead of one hmm are you able to see this uh so just one thing will <clears throat> so when we are changing the mux loading we would be doing at the time of like once we have discovered the failure during time of testing we would be doing that programming at that time right yes okay sir Hmm. As soon as you test it, if there is a failure, you can always do it like that, and that is when you do it. Once you blow the fuses, uh, this this transition is permanent. As soon as you power up, this transition would happen up automatically. Hmm. So, in an active cycle, what you are essentially seeing in terms of timing penalty is some extra capacitance on this mux, and that could be of the order of fifty picoseconds. so in terms of timing penalty row redundancy has higher timing penalty but row redundancy has much lesser area penalty is this clear because for area whatever comparator or control signal you wanted to generate for io region for shifting those bit slices that that is there in every io whereas the comparator is there only once in the in the row redundancy case so this comparator area actually takes the overall area penalty of redundancy for a toss even if the total number of bits cells that you are adding remain same the area penalty on uh bit slice redundancy would be higher uh, so there was just one thing uh like we i was able to get ki we are having area penalty but see once we are testing and uh programming after testing so we would be incorporating some kind of additional features before that right even before testing so that i can fuse at the time of failure if i get to know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that area thing i am already taking care of right so it is not dependent like Why? i'm just changing some kind of same so the Finally, if your die without redundancy was 1 1 mm square now because of redundancy some area would increase whether you are adding that redundancy you are mean you mean to add more fuses extra rows or extra columns or bit slices in the sram doesn't matter but area penalty will be there will be there oh so this point all, only i was see sir so, so once we had manufactured a die so die area is it is not about manufacturing it is not about after during manufacturing or after manufacturing there is a there is a die which does not have repair implemented on it there is a okay. die which has repair implemented on it Okay, that is where we will look for the area penalty. Okay, so but uh, won't the every die would be having this kind of repair repairability no. mechanism? Why? Why? So I mean, I can choose to not use it if there is no failure, but there needs to be right because only no. after testing I can get to know. No, the process has to be mature enough to say that okay, if the if the total capacity on chip capacity is less than let us say sixteen uh, megabits. Or 32 megabits, I will assure you that good yield without redundancy. Process has to guarantee something, na? Otherwise, so har dar ap, so to process ki density ka matlab hi nahi hua. Okay, so taking the input from the like qualifications, more qualifications, we can come yes. to the conclusion. Okay. So how how much redundancy to put and whether to put or not, these are not indep, these are not decisions taken independent of what the process team says. process team usually gives the guideline that you should have a repair capability beyond 16 megabit so if there is a 
chip implementation, which has less than 16 megabit, there is no repair functionality implemented there. Hmm? So that was for the last class. Today, uh, so any, any questions from the last class before we move to today's session? Can you re-explain about the debugging? About? Debugging mode in IO. Oh, that was not exactly the class part. That was the project part. We can discuss that in the office hours. Okay. That was not in the, that was during the project discussion. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Anything more about redundancy or repair? Perfect. So let's move to today's session then. And today, what we are going to do is we are going to talk about what is called as cache subsystem. What do you, so you've heard about caches? What are caches? What uh, is a cache? Ca caches are the small, uh, small capacity, high speed memories that are, uh, uh, that are placed uh, nearer to the processor. Uh, so that it map, uh, so that processor doesn't wait to, uh, to get uh, the uh, chunks of the memory directly from the main memory. It can look at the cache itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that is that is a little extra detail. My question was actually I was just wanting to arrive at what is a cache. So cache by itself means something that remains hidden, but that is something which is very readily available to you. Hmm? That is where you would use the term cache. And over here, when we're talking about cache subsystem, uh, we are, as Ranjit mentioned, we're talking about uh, something which, uh, some small memory which could be placed very close to the processor so that the overall access time for the processor is reduced. Let us look at why it is needed. So in a typical system, in a typical you know, uh, memory system, you would see that there is a CPU and then there is a cache, which is typically an SRAM associated with it. The SRAM would interact with what we call as a DRAM and which would then interact with what is called as the hard disk. Hmm? As you move from hard disk to caches, the speed increases. So in the caches also, there could be L1, L2, L3 kind of caches. So L1 means for level one, closest to the processor. L2 is level two and level three is closer to the output, to the, to the main memory. That is the DRAM, okay? So what has happened over the past many years is that the processor speed has increased kind of exponentially or largely exponentially at a very fast pace. Whereas the main memory speed has not increased at the same pace. It has been, a, it is also improving, but at a much lower pace. So it was uh, 2x performance in one and a half years and over here DRAM 2x performance over 10 years. So it is not that it is not improving, it is improving, but at a much slower pace. And therefore, because of this you know, performance gap between processor and the memory, because of this performance gap, we need to use something which we call as caches. So what, and, and there is another reason why this is possible. What we say is, so there is this, uh, uh, there is this reference to locality of references, mention of locality of references. What this means is that typically when you are running a program on a system or something like that, uh, you will you will usually use some lines of the same program over and over again. For example, uh, if, we, if we say that we are working on this PPT presentation, huh, then it is evident that the program, the, the instruction codes linked to uh, rendering a PPT onto the screen will be run over and over again. You know? I would not be using a calculator like when I'm when my my when I'm showing a PPT, then I'm not always using a calculator simultaneously. I may use it, but I may not always use it. 
For example, at this point of time, I'm using a PowerPoint application, I'm using Zoom application, I'm using another streaming application so that I'm able to communicate with all of you. So these three or four things that are running on my computer and uh, not much else. I do not really need data linked to uh, one of my projects or data links to one of the presentations that I made yesterday to a faculty meeting or anything like that. So the information that I need is, is not the entire hard disk. I do not need the entire hard disk to be made available to me or the processor at all times. The processor would usually work on much smaller chunks of data. And that this data in terms of address is also referenced close together. Hmm? That uh, when I save something, uh, let us say when I save a movie or uh, when I save a music somewhere, uh, the music file is, is long enough uh, to say that, okay, 10 words it will occupy or 100 words it will occupy and so on. Hmm? And these words usually will be consecutive words because that is how you would typically want to store. Hmm? So when the processor would want to render your movie or to need to uh, need to amplify the music that you are playing it will be there will be a locality of references in the sense that adjacent address addresses would be accessed uh, every passing second or every passing moment is this part clear so because we have this uh, locality of references we say that uh, we do not really need the entire big memory to be accessed every cycle, let us use a relatively small SRAM, which can be placed physically close to the processor so that not only it would have a smaller access time, the physical proximity also reduces via delays. Huh? So what we are essentially trying to do is we're trying to keep commonly accessed data in smaller or faster, faster memory. And when we do this, another thing that we take care of is, suppose this is L3 cache, the L2 cache, L1 cache, and over here it is processor. What we also ensure is the data of L1 cache is also available in L2 cache somewhere. And data of L2 cache, let us say this, is also available somewhere in my L1 cache. L3 cache. So this is referred to as what is called as inclusion property. That uh, a lower level memory, if we say that L1 is lower level than uh, L2 or L3, is almost always included in the higher level of the memory. So all the data of L1 is available in L2. All the data of L2 is available in L3. Hmm? I have spoken quite a bit, moved many slides in one go. Any questions? But I moved fast simply because I felt you have done the CA course, most of you, and therefore should be able to capture it. Uh, oh. Sir, so yes. by this line, physical proximity reduces wire delay. What are we trying to say? Uh, so the wire delays are reduced. What would happen? Access would be faster. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. If I reduce the wire delays, the access would be faster. The purpose of using a small SRAM was also the same thing. That you are able to, because it's a small SRAM, not the full DRAM, uh, the access times are shorter are smaller. So you are overall able to access the content much faster. Sir, uh, if processor miss, uh, if if it is a miss in the L1 cache, if I have to bring it from the DRAM, so first uh, directly I will bring DRAM to L1 or uh, L3, L2 and L1 in hierarchy? Yeah, so that we will come to. We miss ki baat bhi humne kari nahi. So we'll talk about hits and misses in just a little while. Abhi tak jo kaha, any questions there? L1, L2, that is especially referring to as the virtual memory. I'm sorry? 
so the one l2 uh, concept hierarchy that is you are calling the virtual memory here so virtual memory concept is different if you done the computer architecture course this reference is coming from there don't worry about it it's not something that you need to worry about i just gave this so that those of you who have done ca course are able to understand it better virtual memory is a standard term sir so i got disconnected while you were explaining this physical proximity thing can you please explain that okay okay so my question was faisal uh, yes. what happens when the wire delay reduces when the wire will able to ex like it will be faster when the delay reduces yeah so it means that you will be able to run the memory at the processor speed yes sir so we were not able to directly access the dram because there is a huge gap in the performance that was what you were looking in the previous slide there is a huge performance gap now by keeping the memory close using a small first we used an sram then we used a small sram and then we placed it close to the processor all these three things using an sram yes. srams are faster than drams a small sram means a small sram is definitely faster than a bigger sram and keeping it physically close to the processor so that delays in the wires also reduce okay we are doing all this to fill the performance gap that we talked about in the previous slide okay okay sir thank you okay so we are doing all this to that uh, bridge that gap that you were showing earlier the dram and the yes because i want my processor to not keep waiting i want my processor to operate very fast because there is also technology only so that same technology is the processor yeah so okay okay sir so why do we uh, have to store some data of l1 into l2 and some data of l2 into l3 okay why do you think we need to do that so you are asking why do we need the inclusion property ha huh, yes sir. why is it that l1 should always be available in l2 and l2 should always be available in l3 why do you think so what what do you what can you imagine as a reason so basically i can imagine if if there is any issue with l1 will we can fetch data with l2 from l2 yes anything so else that you can think of no nice, sir anyone else who can think of something else uh, sir can this be due to the to maintain the cache coherency yeah so that is the question why do we need to maintain cache coherency uh sir so, so suppose some uh, we have two cores running parallelly and a uh, particular data uh, is being uh, uh, read in one of the cores and uh, it is being manipulated uh, it is being computed in other cores so when there is uh, a when the data is written uh, suppose in the core b then uh, this particular uh, data is captured by the uh, higher level of the cache and then the uh, snoop control unit uh, senses it and the other core uh, the core a will check whether if the data is changed or not then uh, through the hierarchy that uh, particular data will be changed hmm. so let us put it a little simply for the class because not everyone in the class may have done ca and and in that detail that you are talking about hmm? yes. so uh, a, a very simple thing is that suppose your processor you know when you are processing you said a plus b is equal to c now the content of location c are changed because you did an operation inside the processor yes sir now let us say there is another core which is using similar data or same data should we tell that core that okay c is now updated okay so acha yes so now how do i tell Core two that C is updated unless I have an L two there where A B C are all stored, huh? And L two I tell that okay update the C. How will processor two come to know that there is a change somewhere? Hmm. So that is about cache coherency. So. there are many units they which tell that okay this is how the data is updated and this is how any change in data across or due to one core is communicated to another core and so on uh i would also bring in the concept of hey 
किसी कोहरेंसी से लिंक्ड ही है बट अब स्टिल मोर फंडामेंटल कॉन्सेप्ट सपोज यू वॉन्ट टू राइट समथिंग इन फ्रॉम योर प्रोसेसर और टू द मेन मेमोरी नाउ नाउ द मेन मेमोरी एक्सेस टेक्स हंड्रेड ऑफ नैनो सेकेंड्स you cannot really do it you cannot really wait those hundreds of nanoseconds so what do you want to do okay i will now write back into l2 and only in l2 and then i will say l2 will automatically plan and write in the main memory so if i have to write back some data into l2 then l2 should already have that location with it first so that is another reason why inclusion is important that the higher level of uh, memory should always contain the lower level memory contents in it okay so writing in l2 means we have to first write it in the l1 and that will same be copied in l2 or directly we are writing in l2 you tell me i think we should write in l1 first right yes ha na you have to otherwise how will you maintain the coherency between l1 and l2 also the processor would write something in l1 it would write it within one cycle now when l1 so we will talk about this when in in just a few minutes also now when l1 needs to uh, put some other data in this particular location the new data that was already written uh, in the memory should be written into the l2 cache so when you write into the l2 cache can still be variable when you are being replaced you can write then or whenever if there was a write operation on you you could write then that is a oa operating system issue but uh, you first write into l1 because the processor is interacting only with l1 processor does not interact directly with l2 and then through l1 you will write in l2 whenever you have uh, an opportunity or whenever there is a need is that clear yes sir okay. so we like the everything that gets read or write it goes to this whole hierarchy of l1 l2 l3 and main memory yes so what that would mean a uh, more power consumption in terms of the, right we are gaining in terms of speed but in terms of power we are is a cost okay you anyway had to read okay So, but like we are right, we are right, reading and writing the same thing at multiple places, right? I mean, first you have to go to that and that and that. But you are, but look at it like this. See, A plus B equal to C. You did it once, but then on the same screen you brought in another data. On the same screen you brought in another data. So you would actually be ending up doing this A plus B equal to C hundreds of times. If there was no cache hierarchy, then all these hundreds of times you will have to go and access the main memory. that is much much more power than doing all these operations right away in a small on chip cache okay the power kind of system bus is more as compared to this okay yeah you have to go off the chip you have to drive big big buffer so that the off chip signal has some current some significant current and voltage so as soon as you talk of going off chip power consumption goes for a toss okay sir okay so what does cache mean this is just a very quick preview you say that uh in the cache memory i will store the data that we want to store and when i st talk of storing this data in each row i will also store an additional piece of information which is called as tag this tag represents uh some address bits of the main location there original location in the say main memory okay so when you access the memory uh the tag that you read from the memory is compared with the tag which is available in the address field when the request was sent only if the tags match only if the tags match we say that uh you know we we come to know if this data that i read from the cache was even relevant to me or not if it was relevant i i transmit this data if it was relevant i transmit this data to the processor 
if it was not relevant, then I would not transmit this data. I would instead uh, uh, give out an instruction so that the data is pulled from the main memory and stored here. Is that okay? So we'll go in, into more details of this, but as a top level operation, is it is it okay to understand that there are some tag bits which are a part of address, there is a comparator, and then there is a mux which would say whether I have to send this data out or another data out. Is this part clear? Hello? Yes, sir. So do we have to uh, compare every time like with the address tag? You tell me, what do you think? I don't think so. Like it will not be feasible. Man, feasible ki baat nahi hai. Feasible to hoga, haan. Lekin do you need to or do you not need to? Hmm? Nahi karna chahiye. Nahi karna chahiye. So suppose you wanted, uh, you wanted the coordinates of your home to be released, but you are also accessing on the map uh, coordinates of your uh, college at the same time. Yes, sir. Hmm? Now, when you were checking the coordinates for the home, the latitude time it checked and it ensured that the latitude was of your home. Yes, sir. But when the longitude was given out, it said, nahi, nahi, latitude was for home, so longitude would be home ka yoga. So will you reach your home or will you reach your office or will you reach some other location altogether? Some other location, obviously. Is it acceptable? Not, not acceptable. Okay. Yes, so okay. whenever you are accessing the cache, you have to ensure that the tag is matching. Okay. Yes. Sir. If the tag is not matching, it means it could be some old data or some other data. It is definitely not the data that you are looking for. Yes, sir. So uh, uh, can you can you please reiterate the flow like? Uh, we have to check the address tag. Like we have to compare address tag with whatever was stored as tag with the data inside the cache. Okay. 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 Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. So in, in the example that we gave, the tag could be home latitude, home longitude, or college latitude, college longitude. So tags yes, could be home and college. And you're just checking. Are am I is the is the person in front of me asking me for my home address or is he asking me for my college address? Yes, sir. Okay. So this check has to be done. Sir, sir, actually, I couldn't understand this tag operation. I mean, I'm sorry. I was not able to understand this tag operation, sir. Yeah, tag is not an operation. Tag is simply data as we will move forward. So this is just a quick preview. So I'm not expecting you to understand it fully. We will look at the operation in more detail in the next slides. Okay, but sir. this is just to give you a feel that there are some comparisons happening. And after that, you give out the data. Yes, sir. comparison and then data would be out. Yeah. So let us now look at uh, some key specifications of a cache subsystem. We'll come to a better understanding of tag also in just a little while. As we discuss these key performance metrics, you will see tag, the purpose of tag will automatically become clear to you. So we're talking about a memory, access time, capacity. There are two variables which you will very easily understand. Am I right? What is the capacity of your cache such system? That you can understand. Now, associativity. Associativity means that suppose I wanted to um, store latitudes hmm, of some locations, addresses, some addresses I wanted to store the latitudes and longitudes. How many latitudes can I store? And how many la longitudes can I store? Hmm? Or can I, uh, can I, can I have, uh, uh, can I also store, let us say, a photograph or something else of this, something in my system? So how many uh, locations in the cache is a given address eligible to be placed in? For example, 
I have uh, two buckets, latitude and longitude. And in bucket one, I have 10 locations. In bucket two, I have 10 locations. So associati associativity would be, uh, let us say, two over here. In, so you will either come in the latitude, so I'd, any location in the latitude bucket or any location in the longitude bucket, bucket will tell you how many latitudes and longitudes you can save. Again, we will come to it in, uh, in much more detail in just a little while. Uh, replacement policy, I think this is intuitive. Suppose my cache is full. Cache is a very small memory. Suppose it goes full and I want to store or you know, new data or run a new program or a movie that was the first, first sequence. Pura ho gaya. Now the second sequence needs to be loaded. Which, which part of the cache would you replace? Hmm? That is another key specification for the cache subsystem. We will look into it in detail as to what kind of replacement policies exist. Another feature or another specification around the cache subsystem is, do we have a unified cache or a separate instruction and data cache? Uh, in a unified cache, both data and instructions could be stored in the same cache. But as the second case in, uh, suggests, you could also keep independent instruction and independent data cache. What could be the benefit of uh, keeping independent in the instruction and data caches? Uh, sir, if you have sub, uh, independent instruction and data cache, uh, then as we look at the uh, normal execution of a particular instruction, the first will be the fetch, the second decode, uh, a fetch, decode, execute, and the memory access, and finally, uh, uh, the right uh, re re register right stage. So if we have unified memory, then uh, the fetch stage and the uh, memory read stage will uh, coincide. And mm -hmm. there can be uh, a loss of single cycle, uh, a, a cycle time. So if we have dedicated instruction and data cache, then we can, uh, then we have the, uh, then we can execute both of them independently. And there'll be no loss of single time, cycle time. Yes. Also, it could happen that there are there is one instruction which is running on multiple data. If you have just one cache which is unified, it means every time instruction also needs to be fetched and every time data also needs to be fetched. But if you have separate caches, what does it mean? Oh, instruction, I have already list put it out on my register. Uh, that instruction you can continue to use, but uh, the data cache you may just access it more frequently. So that also is one thing, one thing that would change. So overall power of the system, performance of the system can change depending on whether you are using unified or separate caches for instruction and data. So let's first look at access time. Uh, we're talking about four things here. Uh, the probability of a hit, that is probability of finding the address location that you want to access inside your L1 cache. Uh, do you understand probability of a hit? See, so, hit. My address mil gaya. Yeah, the main memory is very huge. You only saved selective addresses inside your L1 cache or L2 cache and so on. Hmm? So, the probability that the address that you were looking for is now available in the L1 or L2 cache is P hit. Probability hit. And then uh, P miss. Huh? That it was not there. Now, if it was there, then what happens? The memory, the small SRAM simply reads out the data and there is a fast access time there. Huh? However, if it, uh, if the hit doesn't happen, if there is a miss, then you know that you will have to go to a higher level of hierarchy. Which means that uh, the time involved would would be higher, would be would be more. So there is a different timing now, which is called as t miss. So probability of hit into the time that it takes when you are when you read after a hit, and probability of a miss, and the time it takes to fetch the data from L2 cache or wherever so that it is now available in L1 cache and for the processor 
is referred to as T miss, the penalty linked to a miss. Okay. And therefore, average excess time is P hit into T hit plus P miss into T miss. Is this clear? Hello? Any questions? So why we are writing it as average time? Shouldn't we write it as total time? Sorry. Total time. Why? I access one memory location and uh, it was a hit and the time it took to access that particular location was uh, just T hit. Yes, sir. Hai na? So the total time is T hit only. Agar hit nahi hai, then I will have a different timing which is T miss. Yes, sir. So how does this become total time? It still remains average time. There will be instances when there is a T miss, which is much, uh, uh, which is much longer. Achha, overall, I, uh, dekh rahe hain, to yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Na? So that is what is excess time. Let's take an example. Uh, a memory, uh, like a memory system consists of a cache and the main memory. If it takes one cycle to complete a cache hit and 100 cycles to complete a cache miss, what is the memory average access time? Can you find this out? If the hit rate is say 97%. Can you find this out? So 3.97 units. 3.97 cycles. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now, if you want less number of misses, you want the probability of hit to be higher, uh, you can use a bigger cache. If you have a bigger cache, the the probability of a miss reduces. If your cache could be as big as the main memory, there will be zero misses. Are you with me? So I'm not able to understand this statement. Uh, agar... So why is there a miss? Uh, let us answer this question first. Why is there a miss? So why is something not available in the cache? Yes, sir. अच्छा हम ओवरऑल कैश की बात कर रहे हैं मैं मैं ये समझ रहा था अब तक कि वी आर चेकिंग ईच ईच रो कि हां ये वाला रो में है या नहीं है फिर ये वाले में है या नहीं है फिर ये वाले में है या नहीं है नहीं, हम कैश की बात कर रहे हैं हां तो फिर कैश इफ इफ कैश बिकम्स इक्वल्स टू द मेन मेमोरी देन द प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑफ इट विल बी 100 व्हाटएवर यू वांटेड इज आल्सो अवेलेबल इन योर कैश इज इट यस 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 सर सो देयर विल बी जीरो पीएमएस एवरीथिंग विल बी हिट Yes, sir. That much you cannot do. DRAM is much denser cell than the SRAM. If you say that, okay, I will have the L1 cache as the same size as my DRAM there, then the area would simply blow up. The Moreover, since the size becomes big, the performance gain that you had thought of earlier would no longer be there. Are you able to see this? Hello? Any questions? Clear here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, we say that bigger capacity could be better. However, bigger caches are slower. So, there is a declining return on investment as the cache size goes up. Hmm? When we talk of cache size, we also talk of what is called as cache line length or also called as a block. Hmm? So the concept of a line length is that uh, if there is a miss and you need to fetch something from a higher level of memory, then do not bring in just one address. Bring in one full block. Why? Why is bringing a block more important than just one location? Uh, sir, to exploit special locality, 
Yes, we just talked about it that typically it will be adjacent addresses that would be, you know, that would be required by the system. So you bring in a, a full block so that uh, there are less number of misses. There is more number of hits. Additionally, when you do that, you will see that uh, uh, the overall access time, you know, time to fetch reduces because uh, while the first access may take a lot of time, subsequent addresses could be faster. We call that as burst mode. Huh? So you get uh, two kinds of benefits. First, the number of misses reduce. Second, that uh, fetching a bigger address has is, is overall cheaper in terms of total time than fetching uh, just a small one word at a time. A bigger block will take lesser time uh, in comparison to if all the words were accessed individually. Okay. And uh, this, this function, are you able to see this? This says that I will bring about, let us say, 256 words in one block. But uh, you want to bring that many words, but what happens? What happens is that the bus that you have from the memory to your processor is much smaller. It can at most transmit two words or four words. So whenever you there is a miss, how many cycles would you need? First, you will need to access the, the word for the first time. Then, since there were only four words that could be accessed in one cycle, you will need what is called as 64 additional cycles to read the subsequent words. Are you able to see this? I say that my block size is 256, so that 256 consecutive words are written into my L2 cache or L1 cache, wherever. Hmm. Uh, but 256 words may not be able to be transmitted right away. So there will be multiple transmissions required. And that is what we are representing by line length upon fetch width. And this is the, the delay uh, taken when the subsequent address or subsequent location is being fetched questions uh, so can i yeah boy uh, can i say that t first is t miss and t subsequent is t hit continuously no 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 so this yeah. is t fetch this is t fetch as you may say t miss total t fetch is equal to t miss Agar miss hua, so you will get two to six words from the L2 cache into the L1 cache. So that is what a steam is. If I get this uh, block from the L1 to block CPU, hmm. then so CPU will use only one word at a time. CPU will give only one address. Okay. The remaining you are copying simply to take benefit of spatiality. You said CPU has asked for only one word now, but I know that due to the spatial uh, locality thing, uh, I would I would anyways need to access the second, third, fourth word also pretty soon. So let, when I'm accessing a first word, let me get all the four words in one go. So T hit has not changed. T hit has not changed. So P hit had, would change because now you are bringing in the entire block together and we're talking about what is called as spatial locality. So P hit will improve, but otherwise uh, T hit has not changed. T miss or T fetch has increased a bit in fact, because now you need to bring in more words. Hmm? Yes, sir. So T miss bad gaya, P hit kam ho gaya. P hit has reduced, T, P miss has reduced, uh, P hit has improved, P miss has reduced, 
but TMS has increased. So how does this play out in terms of total delay? So, you know, as you increase the line size, as you increase the line size, the total number of, suppose your L1 cache was 1024 words, let us say. Huh? And you said my line size is 256. So how many different programs related words, uh, how many different programs can it cater to? Four? Yes, sir. Hmm? So what happens? If the numbers of programs increases, if the numbers of programs that I'm running in parallel increases, what would happen? There will be more misses. Now, because I have no, no further location, where I fifth program, ke liye so there will be misses now. Huh? So, uh, if my line size is very small, then I anyway have frequent misses because of spatial locality. However, if my line size becomes very large, even then there are misses. Are you able to understand this? So line size was the number of words we can get at a time, right? The number of words you will fetch whenever there is a miss. So like the block kind of thing we can get at yes. a time, right? Yes, line size is equal to block. As the block size increases, the total number of blocks that you can store in your cache reduces. Therefore, the miss rate starts to increase again. So initially when I'm getting more blocks, then uh, the hit will become less because we can get the data in that. But after that, it is that is not clear why it is increasing. Uh, suppose uh, one block, so each block refers to one particular program that you're running on your processor. Okay. okay. Now you want to run 10 programs. You have only four blocks in your cache. The number of messages would increase, no? Aap word chala rahe the. You, you're, you're using Word on your computer and you are using PowerPoint and you are using Zoom and you are using that streaming service. Huh? Now you say that I also want to use, let us say, uh, I also want to listen to music while, while I'm on the call or whatever. So what happens? Now there is a fifth kind of addresses that you need, but so a fifth block that you need to store, but your L1 cache is already full with four blocks. Whenever you want to now access the music part, it will have to replace one of these blocks here. Replace means there was a miss and therefore replacement was necessitated. Is it clearer now? So, so it is not like that key, uh, my cache uh, capacity decides what the line size would be. That is not the case. So, you will realize it does because if it was a one kilobit, one kilobyte memory that was that smaller size, then I would have probably kept the line size at either 16 or 64. Whereas if it was a 256 kilobyte memory, I can keep it as small as four or as big as 256, doesn't matter. For resource constraint chips, it may matter. And therefore, for a small, when there's a small cache, it could be of interest to see what is the optimal line size. Otherwise, here, see, for most of the other capacities, higher capacities, line size has minimal impact. Look at this 5% to 2-3%, two, two, the black line. The orange line, the bottommost orange line is uh, something like 2-3% to three percent to almost 0%, almost 0.1%. So, uh, the line size has to be decided in, in consonance with the memory capacity. So, uh, who is deciding this line, line size basically? Like, mm, you as an operating system designer. 
ओके और यू एज अ फर्मवेयर डिजाइनर ओके सो इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग टू रियलाइज इज द हिट रेट द एवरेज टाइम इज एन इंपॉर्टेंट पैरामीटर परफॉर्मेंस इंडिकेटर दैन जस्ट द हिट रेट बिकॉज एवरेज एक्सेस टाइम इंक्लूड्स द मिस एंड द मिस पेनल्टी इन टर्म्स ऑफ टाइमिंग सो वाइल इंक्रीजिंग लाइन लेंथ इंप्रूव हिट रेट बट इट ऑल्सो इंक्रीज सेच टाइम is this clear so the tms will increase as you increase the line size but probability of hit would also increase probability of miss would reduce it's a trade off that you can always work out for your system theek okay? hai so this is another view that uh, as the block size increases uh, the miss penalty increased the miss rate initially fell but then increased and consequently because the penalty was increasing the uh, you know the miss penalty was increasing and because miss rate was also increasing the block size you know uh, the the overall access time average access time becomes very sensitive to the block size huh so in this particular example for for this this could be an average block size that you may want to keep are you with me this we are plotting uh, like for the like the 1 kb memory right whatever be the capacity so but in the earlier figure we were saying that when it was 256 it was not increasing so that was this particular experiment na raghav okay this is not something that we have written in stone okay this is one experiment to just to demonstrate something to you ha uh, we ran two benchmarks and we could come up with this graph you would run 24 benchmarks and you may see there is a uh, even this one you will see that okay there are more misses and something like this could happen i don't know ha na so it's about one benchmark we observed but it is good enough to give you a feeling that this happens ha huh? okay so okay that's the general relationship that yeah yeah uh, okay yes so when you explained the tms equation so you said that uh, it corresponds to one uh, burst of transfer mhm mm so so uh, is the cache line length any in any way related to the burst size so the the fetch width the fetch width you could say could be linked to the total number of uh, words i can fetch quickly before selecting the next row yes sir so the fetch width is the parallel transfer that like uh, it can fetch be fetch width is the parallel transfer yes yeah. uh, okay isko thoda sa main kyunki maine burst wala word introduce kar diya tha let me explain it a bit little more Uh, you know that a memory, let us say eight one nine two, cross thirty two memory that we are making in our project, huh? In our course project, we are making this memory. Yes, sir. So let us say this is the memory, but my processor is an eight bit processor. So how many words are stored per? Uh, how many uh, address locations would be stored per access? So I, I at any point of time I am accessing thirty two bits. in a way for my processor i am accessing four words are you able to see this yes sir so that becomes my fetch width okay sir now burst mode comes into picture where because let we have we add this concept of let us say mux 16 that is the exact instance we are making yes sir so what we are saying is that physically inside the memory physically inside the memory 13, 16 words are placed right next to each other 
Yes, sir. So, when I when I access any particular row, I would say I will read all the sixteen words in one go. Okay. Sixteen L one words. Let us say L one words. कहते हैं इसको. नहीं तो वो कन वो इस वाले words से confusion होना शुरू. So this is processor words. Okay. so one l1 word is equal to four processor words ye clear hai uh, okay sir but uh, sir, i l1... also i also know that 16 l1 words are placed in the same row sir ye thoda aap repeat kar sakte hain sir ye thoda miss ho raha hai sir 16 l1 is happening in cache and the four words that is uh, for the processor so the main yes. memory हाँ नहीं नहीं मेन मेमोरी नहीं मेन मेमोरी की बात नहीं है प्रोसेसर इज एन एट बिट प्रोसेसर सो फॉर अ प्रोसेसर वन वर्ड इज एट बिट टू बिट या इट्स थर्टी टू बिट सो दैट्स वाई फोर वर्ड्स या सो वन मेमोरी एल वन मेमोरी एक्सेस कैन गिव यू फोर वर्ड्स इन वन गो और वन एल टू एक्सेस कैन गिव यू फोर प्रोसेसर वर्ड इन वन गो वॉट आई एम सेंग इज दैट देर इज ऑल्सो दिस कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ मार्क्स Yes. What does marks mean? Marks means that physically, when you access one particular row, sixteen words will be selected. Out of them, you will multiplex and select one word as an output. Yes, sir. है ना? So because sixteen words were selected, I say that मैं उन sixteen के sixteen को read कर लेता हूँ और उनको एक एक जगह पे save कर लेता हूँ locally. ठीक है तो अब जब मेरे को इन 16 वर्ड्स को एक्सेस करना है तो मेरे को बार बार मेमोरी के अंदर कंट्रोल्स कंट्रोल ब्लॉक के थ्रू जाके वर्ड लाइन सेलेक्ट करके बिट लाइन डिस्चार्ज और सेंस एम्पलीफायर को एक्टिवेट करके कुछ करने की जरूरत नहीं है डायरेक्टली इस लोकेशन से मैं 16 के 16 वर्ड्स फट 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 रीड कर सकता हूँ Yes, sixteen cycles, but I can read. Okay, so burst happens afterward. After this uh, complete line of cache is available, so after that we decide what the burst size can be. No. Like you've already saved uh, the sixteen words that we can now uh, access uh, at, like very quickly. Yeah. So uh, why did we choose sixteen? Because we had max sixteen. Okay, so the max size. I could size... choose a burst length of eight also, or four also, because my max would allow that. But can I choose a burst length of thirty-two? No. No. So can you illustrate how a uh, max eight, like burst size of eight, can be achieved? Oh, I simply would say that okay, uh, uh, may. मेरे एक मेरे एक रो में लेटर से आ जा भाई एक मिनट सो so, मेरे एक रो में सोलह वर्ड थे वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट नाइन टेन इलेवन ट्वेल्व थर्टीन फोर्टीन फिफ्टीन सिक्सटीन लेटर से सोलह वर्ड थे हाँ बट आई से दैट आई नीड एट ओनली सो आई विल Read this. I will read this. I will read this. I will read this, and so on. So eight okay implement. Okay, burst length of eight. Yes, sir. है ना? Smaller burst length तो implement करने में कोई challenge ही नहीं है because आपकी line anyway सोलह words को access कर सकती थी अब आप कह रहे हो कि आठ आठ को उनमें से आप use करोगे, which is fine. Okay, so the cache line size is the maximum burst width we can have. Burst size. No. Because we cannot go beyond sixteen words. So, no. Right. Burst length cannot go beyond sixteen. Line length के भी बात नहीं करी मैंने. Okay so, sir. Okay. Wait. Let me come clear. So we are talking about different things. Line length. Burst length.
uh, and uh, what do you say word नहीं इसको नहीं ये ये नहीं कहते लाइन लेंथ और बर्स्ट लेंथ का डिफरेंस आपको पता लग रहा है अभी नहीं पता लग रहा उसमें कंफ्यूज हो रहे हो लाइन लेंथ इज रिलेटेड टू कैश कैश सब सिस्टम है ना बर्स्ट लेंथ इज लिंक्ड टू योर मेमोरी इंडिपेंडेंट ऑफ कैश यस सर एंड वी कैन चूज दैट बर्स्ट लेंथ कैन बी वेरीड बर्स्ट लेंथ कैन बी वेरीड लाइन लाइन लेंथ कैन बी वेरीड ओके you could say that my line length is a 64 processor words yahan pe kaha na line size is 64 processor words yes sir but in reality one access would give you only four processor words kyunki aap 32 bit the so it means you will need four accesses to the memory Yes, sir. To get your sixteen there. Yes. You know. Now these four accesses could be burst mode accesses. Okay. So that P subsequent goes down. The only purpose is to reduce T subsequent. Yes, sir. Okay. So on me, Aya. Yes, sir. For the first time, it uh, takes more time because we are fetching from the main memory, and then uh, for the subsequent ones, uh, it gets reduced. Yeah, because you could be there. applying burst mode, you could be applying multiple things so that it it reduces. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, that is that is where we have these kind of curves in place. Then that as you increase the size, the first penalty is higher, but subsequent words you can reach much faster. Uh, when we are talking of line, we are thinking in terms of blocks. But when talking of word burst, we are thinking of so the words of the proper memory no that memory. we were. Yeah, of the of the SRAM. Okay, and so each block can refer to like multiple rows. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure, sir. ठीक है. So that is how you would access data. But how do you determine if this data that you wanted is in the cache or not? Huh? Or if the data is in the cache, how do we find that data? So what do we have? The information that we have is address of data, and we also know how the cache is organized. Hmm? Uh, how the cache is organized? Let us say, I say that the the cache is organized in terms of a direct map cache. What does direct map cache means? Direct map cache means that depending on the address of my data i would write to only one particular location in the memory what does that mean uh, let us say aate uh, hain direct map cache pe aate hain but uh, there will be only one location where i will be able to write inside the memory that is what is called as direct map cache then there are Set of set of caches where you say that okay, this cluster me, कहीं पे भी लिख सकते हो आप, okay, and so on. So in a memory, in a cache memory, uh, there is something as we said which is called as tag. After that tag, you actually have the address bus is broken into different components like index block and byte hmm? so the byte will tell you which word which byte to pick up block will tell you which block theek hai uh, which uh, amongst the uh, which which word in a given block so for example if your block is uh, Uh, 16 words. So, which of these 16 words in the block do you need to access? Then index, uh, by row, and then tag. What do they all mean physically? Let us look at that also. We say that uh, there is a 24-bit address for a 16 kilobyte cache. Just 
calculate for 16 kilobyte how many address bits do you need for pain for pain huh 14 you need 14 address bits hai na 16 kilobyte you need only 14 address bits so what to do of the additional 10 bits and they represent this uh, tag index yes they become tag okay now uh, in a memory suppose your your data is organized such that there are 8 bytes of data in every row so how many how many uh, uh, in every block hmm? so how many uh, address bits would you require to identify which byte to be sent to the processor? 11. 3. 11. 3. I have a word. Three. Now I need only three, byte, three, 3 address bits to identify which of these bytes to send to the processor. Hmm? If I say that there are 8 bytes per word or per line, how many blocks or how many lines can there be? Total capacity is 16 kilobytes. I said 8 bytes per line. How many lines can be there? So 12k lines. 2k lines. 2k lines, sorry. 2k lines. Now, if you had to decipher 2K lines, how many address bits would you need? 11. 11. Do you see 24-bit address bus got split as 10 bits for tag, 11 bits for block selection, 3 bits for byte selection in a given block. So in the memory, what were you storing? You were storing 8 bytes of data, 10 bits of tag, and 1 bit which could be valid bit. We will talk about the purpose of valid bit a little later. When you access a particular line or a location, the tag is fetched along with it because it is in the same, wo same word. When the tag is fetched along with it, you compare the 10 address bits of the incoming data and whatever was stored over here inside the memory. If they match, you say this is my 20, this is the data corresponding to that 24 bit address. If they do not match, you say I have a miss. Are you able to see this? Is the purpose of tag clear now? Raghav, you had a confusion regarding purpose of tag. Is the purpose of tag clear now? So actually, I'm still processing. Actually, the bit splitting is just about it. So your main memory was huge. You would access it with 24-bit addresses. Your cache is much smaller. You need only 14 ad address bits to access the cache so, hmm. but the system when it gives sends out the address it sends out the address regarding the main memory so it always sends out 24 bit address hmm. and you have to ensure that the address that you fetch from the cache is matching the total 24 bit address hmm? that it matches the lower 14 bits is evident because you see that in the physical memory there. Yes. In the 14 element. bits is clear. Yes. Now we need to ensure that 24 bit is matching. So 14 aapne check kar liya. Remaining 10 bits, you actually store whatever the address was alongside the data in the memory itself. So that when you read the cache, you also read the address from where the, the top 10 bits from where the address was fetched initially. Hmm. Now you compare the top 10 bits of your 
tag of your address sent by the processor with the top 10 bits stored over here. If they match, there is a hit. If they don't, there is a miss. So basically tag is only that uh, sort of MSBs of that address, total 24 bit address kind of thing only. Yes. Yeah. That is one way to understand it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Is it clear for everyone? Any questions? Uh, sir, I have one question. Yes. Uh, can we go to the previous slide where we uh, uh, where we have definitions? Yeah. Sir, over here uh, there is a separate field for the block as well as a separate field for the uh, tag. Uh, huh. Sir, why is, it, why is it required, sir? Because tag is something which is unique, and uh, a tag is associated for a complete block, right, sir? So this is referred to the twenty. This this bus is the twenty four bit address bus. Yes, sir. This block is 11 bits. By it is three bits. We did not have an index in the given example in the next slide. Hmm. 10 bits. Okay. Is it okay? Mm. So, but in the case of, uh, suppose if we go for set as associative cache, then we'll have index as well as the block. Yes. So yes. At that point in time, then block and uh, tag will, uh, having both of them would be redundant. No, sir. no, no, we will just see that. We will oh. just see that. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So, what will happen you have 11 bits block for the block, because set was not set. Yes. As soon as set comes, uh, let's say, let us say this is 4 bits as associative. 9 would go to block, 2 would go to set. Yes, sir. But you will still need the 10-bit tag. Okay. You will still need the 10-bit tag because your memory is 14-bit addressable. If you use a larger cache, if you instead of 16 kilobyte, you would use 32 kilobyte, your memory becomes 15-bit addressable. Yes. Then you will need a 9-bit tag. Okay. You use a still larger cache, 64 kilobyte. You need an 8-bit tag. Because it is it is the number of address bits which you are not able to use while accessing the physical memory there. Uh, sir? Yes? Uh, sir, you said that uh, when we go for set associative, I mean, first of all, just to clarify, the block bits are referring to the line number, right? Line so, but in set associative, we don't know in which line our data would be. We only know in which set it would be, but the line could be anything. So, how can there be bits for a line number? So, we will see. Abhi so, do, like, am I right in set, set associative? We only know in which set the data would go, and then we match the tag in every line of that set. But we don't know in which line the data is. Yeah, we will see. We will just see. Don't worry. Set associative ko kaise access karna? Abhi dekhte hai. Pahle direct wala samar mein aagaya? Yes, sir. So let's not run ahead of the class because there are some students who will not understand that also. This part, until here, it is clear, everyone? Uh, sir, matlab, uh, like different blocks, jo ek tag hoga, that will be referring to multiple blocks. I mean, multiple blocks can have the same tag. Yes. So, sir, basically, we are doing this tag and all this thing just to maintain because we have the 24, that system bus is similar same. is it just or is it something like i want to go home and i do not want to end up in my office location i am wanting to access that 24 bit address i want to access only that one not another random 24 bit address okay so so like we are breaking the whole address into parts when we are calling some bits we are calling for the data some for the block some for the tag and such yes. so on okay the entire address has to be matched. Hmm? Okay. So now, as I said, this is what we are looking about direct map. There are other kinds of associativity. One way we could say, okay, there is this L1 cache. Uh, there is this cache. You store the data anywhere. And 
then there is also set associator where we say a word can go to a set of location decided by the last few bits of the address hmm? so example ke taur pe for a fully so line 12 needs to be placed in an eight line cache in a fully associative uh, memory line 12 could go anywhere in this place okay in a direct map you simply say what is the address of line 12 line 12 would mean 1100 it says uh, the last three bits are 100 so i can go only to the fourth block okay now a uh, set associative says that this can be very constraining if some other program also wanted to have uh, let us say uh, another program wanted to access 0100 address it would also want to come here or let us say there was another address there was another address which wanted to go there address 20 even then this would want to come here because 100 is matching so they will all want to come here so there will be lots of messages that would happen now we do not want that many messages so we say that okay instead of using all the last three bits because my direct mad memory had eight locations which could be addressed by three bits instead of using all the three bits for determining where to put your data let me use lower two bits instead so 0100 1100 1100 could both be stored now where they will where will they be stored they will be stored in this set 0 if now i want to access 10100 i would want to now replace one of these two not exactly one of both of them and for replacing that now i could use one of the replacement policies but now i will not just enter into miss miss and miss i have more options is this part clear the set fully associative is it clear hello fully associated is it clear any address i could save any line address i could save anywhere in the memory ha huh? direct map there is one location depending on the last three bits because i have an eight uh, i have an eight line cache depending on the last three address bits for the line it will always come here or set associative where i use the only the last two bits and i say they will come in either of these two locations is this clear hello yes sir hmm so now what happens now it means that uh your entries are mapped onto multiple could be mapped onto multiple locations hmm uh your 0001 index could store any of these locations there your 101 ad could store any of these locations there theek hai so this becomes index address and then the block the number of uh, addressing bits for the line reduces
okay coming to the valid bit the valid bit is a flag to indicate whether the content in the cache is valid or not is it clear valid bit is about the is a flag which indicates whether the cache content is valid or not if some other processor has written something into the memory somewhere else the valid bit would go to zero this is also referred to as dirty bit in some vocabulary okay sir but dirty bit it, it will be associated with each cache line no, sir yes yeah. okay so what is happening uh, you have a valid bit you have a cache tag and you have cache data over here five address bits will be used to select which byte uh and five address bits will be used to select which line and remaining address bits will be put as tag clear Uh, so index is to select the set number yes theek hai so uh, i think we will not be able to finish this we will continue this in the next class uh, because uh, there is still something left and uh, we will not be able to close this in today's class so we will stop here any questions so this valid bit is an extra bit right not part of the address yeah it's it's a extra bit not a part of the address it only tells whether the data is valid or not hmm uh, sir usually this dirty bit will be used uh, whenever uh, uh, we are dealing with the uh, replay uh, uh, cache hit on when we write out the cache yeah whenever you're dealing with a system where there could be um, multiple processors accessing the same data you definitely need the valid bit yes okay so just give me a moment let me see how many slides are left i think still many are left if it is just one or two slides we can close it otherwise no there are, there are at least Six to seven slides left. I think let's let's take the remaining part up in the next class. Okay. Uh, sir, I have one doubt. Yes. Sir, can we go to the T fetch uh, uh, part? Sure. Yes. Uh, so here, the in the t fetch part, the ratio line length to the fetch width. So this can be the burst length, no sir. We can term it as a burst length. This could be the burst length, but this may not be. That is where I wanted to differentiate between burst length and uh, line length. Okay. Because burst length it... is about the physical uh, physical dimensions of the memory. Okay. Line length is about what your system decides. to put there yeah theek hai now when you are accessing the main memory and you are writing into the l2 cache the main memory would typically have a burst length of 256 words so usse zyada badi aapki line length nahi hoti hai to hamesha wo match kar jayega burst length and line length may match or line length will almost always be lesser than burst length but when we are doing it from L2 cache to L1 cache, and suppose L2 cache has burst mode access enabled, huh? Then it may not be the case. Okay. You must you may have multiple lines to be accessed for the uh, lines to be written inside. Uh, मतलब uh, your uh, your line length could be 16 words, but your burst length could be four words. so you will need four bursts of data to fill your line in the l1 cache okay okay mm-hmm. you will need four bursts of data 
So then, then in this case, uh, the burst length of four words, what we uh, what we talk, it can be the fetch uh, fetch length also, no, sir. It is the fetch width, yes. It is the immediate fetch width, uh, as we were discussing about. कि आपका thirty two bit का eight one nine two cross thirty two में thirty two bit की आपकी memory है, but hmm. आपका processor eight bit words access करता है. Hmm. So it could be that. Okay. Mm hmm. ओके प्रोसेसर इज ट्राइंग टू फेच ऑनली एट बिट्स एट अ टाइम सो यहां पे हमारा फेच फेच विथ दिस एट बिट्स ओनली वेयर एज द बर्स्ट कैन बी फोर बर्स्ट यस ओके यस सर ठीक है सो विल क्लोज हियर एनीथिंग एल्स ओके ओके देन see uh now we will meet uh, in the after the mid semester break now okay so see you then uh, but also see you hopefully on the day of the exam all the best bye so would you have the office hour on uh, wednesday wednesday was yesterday na nahi to next wednesday nahi hoga office hours next wednesday to aap logo mein se bahuton ka exam chal raha hoga हमारा नहीं भी चल रहा होगा सर। 